Spitfire. Yeah, that's the one. and make the way clear for the invasion. As we well know, Britain and the RAF had other ideas, an appropriately humorous type during the summer of 1940. George Unwin was another of number 19 Squadron's first Spitfire pilots. By the end of 1940, he'd shot down 14 enemy aircraft. Spitfire leading this trio in front of us was shot down. Halfway 19 Squadron. The squad leader Stevens and they, they came around straight into a horde of Stukers 
and uh, they methodically followed fighter command attack number one and went in the pilot officer was killed. The CO that George Unwin mentioned there, the commanding officer, was squadron leader Jeffrey Stevenson flying what turned out to be Spitfire M3200's one and only combat sortie. Five horsepower in the Griffin 65 of the Mark 14, the third of these three aircraft. duty RAF charge and there we see the earliest of the trio touching down the IWM Mark 1A N3200 the Dunkirk veteran for one sortie with Dave Ratcliffe at the controls then we have the Mark 9 which was from Aero Legends at Headcorn Charlie Brown flying that for us today and the Griffin engine to clipped wing for better
wall. based at Pearl Harbor, saw the only combat for the variant in American service. When they downed the... A rather unusual member of the P-40 family because, as I said, it's fitted with a Merlin engine. This one would have been its 45th anniversary season last year. It's the only flying B-17 still operational in Europe. And it acts as a flying memorial to the tens of thousands of Allied aircrew who lost their lives in the European theatre during wartime. And particularly those of the US 8th Air Force stationed here in East Anglia. And as you can clearly see, this is an achieving completion of your full 25 mission tour. We're pretty remote, weren't they? You know, an aircraft as tough as the B-17. Yeah. Yeah, day night bombing um, was the order of the day, and sadly, the cost of that daylight bombing operation was immense. <laughs> Incidentally, the uh, the first mission by the American Air Force during the Second World War was on a, a raid into continental Europe. It was actually led by Paul Tibbetts. Losses. The whole plan of daylight bombing became unsustainable. Expensive operation. Thank you to all of you 
and this pass with smoke on, simulating two damaged engines, pays due tribute. Motorists on the M11 coming up and uh, seeing Sally V land must be fantastic. <laughs> so there, Andrew Dixon and Paul Schluer touching down in the B17. We're delighted to announce that yesterday the aircraft flew with a newly fledged captain in the hot seat for the first time, John Corley, and we look forward to seeing this. the three ship of Bouchons and scrambling underneath them. The P-47 and the P-51s. In this case, the Bouchon was depicting the sort of late war BF 109G and BF 109K variants of the Messerschmitt fighter. All were being operated by the Luftwaffe as World War II played out in 1944 45. more than the wind. judge from the explosions. Well, we now expect them to hopefully bring their guns to bear on this pass. Having got into the air and readied themselves, it's time, surely, for our defending American fighters to join the fight and see off our 109s, the Republic P-47D Thunderbolt, a great beast of an American fighter, leading in its illustrious compatriots, the two North American P-51 Mustangs. Both P-51D models, one of them a two-seat TF-51D, and here they come indeed, P-47 and two Mustangs. airfield defences open up against them once again and now about to play out in the skies over this airfield the sort of combat between German and American fighters that was so common over Europe in 1944 and 45.
have been turned and the three American fighters have engaged the three Messerschmitts. This is, I say, the sort of scenario that played out so often during the latter part of the European air war and the 78th fighter group stationed at Duxford was right in the thick of it. Some years ago, four veterans of the Duxford-based group, nicknamed the Duxford Eagles, and Hayden Richards recalled the sort of bomber escort missions they So we had to turn for home with the B-47. But they knew that we had a limit on the range as far as gas leak and stuff like that. They didn't just bother the car that had to be there. When the B-51 was brought in, we made all the difference in the world because we support back sorties in B-47s and B-51s. In fact, the Mustang today exhibited in our American Air Museum here is painted in his colours. Speaking in 2014, he recalled his first ever encounter with the enemy. First time that I ever recall, we call a gaggle of the uh, fighters. A gaggle of the, they were in any particular formation of the fly, like birds, or, you know, like a flock of birds. And I was looking up and I was looking around. The last person over here was this Dylan Charlie, you know. I looked back and here was an ME 109 firing at me. I could see the flashes of the guns. So I made it. Oh, boy, boy, I broke my hand. I broke my hand. I get up his tail. He dropped his gear and flaps. And of course, I was like this and I had to pull up. The bar came in front of me. The bar thought I'd get in front of me. The experience I had before, I was kind of throttled back. It was like, more or less the speed. Strong. That's fine. Also a reminder, while our next display item readies itself for takeoff down the eastern end of the airfield, that you can take out IW of course a charity dependent on its members to uh, enable the stories it tells to continue to be recalled. If you're not already experience in quieter circumstances all of those aspects of IWM Duxford, notably those related to the historic Duxford exhibition. The exhibition is a presentation by the Great War Display Team. The two, uh, or rather, it's deep to uh, Royal Aircraft Factory SE5A, scale replicas getting into the air, followed by the replica Yuka CL1 and all replica aircraft, in fact. Then we have the Sopwith triplane and the two Fokker DR1s, the Dreideckers, the German triplanes. That perhaps the German aircraft most emblematic of the First World War, although built in very small numbers, which we'll come on to. Aerial warfare, don't forget, was a relatively new practice by the and here come those British and German aeroplanes about to split asunder and enter combat against one another. We've got one AC-5A up above with the Junkers CL-1 which is trailing smoke. Off to our left we've got the two triplanes and the other Fokker triplane has engaged the other SE-5A out to our left. Scout Experimental. The 7th 8th scale replicas. Now in reality, 
society. The dogfight of the First World War would have involved generally many more aircraft than this, dozens of them, in extremely close in tail chases. Nowadays we talk about beyond visual range combat being taken by today's Typhoons, F-35s and so forth. Nothing like that during the Great War. Aircraft would constantly be circling, climbing, diving, accelerating, slowing just to get onto their opponent's tails, and when we say that, we mean right close onto them, using the rudder to make turns, and just get in a shot. And of course, in the early stages of the war, the aircraft were used primarily for reconnaissance, indeed, and pilots took to shooting at each other using revolvers and such like, and then before long, they were fully armed with machine guns and all the rest of them. So the sounding of the last post bringing this display to a close as the six aircraft recover. Of course, the Great War display team in a rather quieter period than was the case for a few years during the centenary commemoration years from 2014 to 2018 of the First World War, but still stalwarts of the display circuit and a huge range of flying experience among their ranks huge range of aircraft building and restoring experience among their ranks as well and these were as we were intimating earlier types with very tricky handling characteristics particularly in the uh, case of the originals with rotary engines so in the case of uh, this display that would have meant the Sopwith and uh, Fokker triplanes going through its considerable aerobatic paces and there with multiple rolls in the vertical. Remember that for display purposes, the aeroplane is being flown at a relatively conservative power setting. Mostly Merlins with one Griffin amongst them are uh, starting or preparing to start on our sideline ready for the finale of today's display on day one of the IWM Duxford Battle Britain Air Show 2021.
human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few.